to come. Father, thank you that we can uh, worship you today. We can sit in your presence, even though we're disconnected physically. Thank you that we're connected by spirit, by your spirit who's in us and with us. And I pray that everyone in whatever room they're in today, that your Holy Spirit will be very present. Even Father, you will go speak through, move through the screen into all the places where we are as your people. Even though we're scattered, thank you that you can unite us. And we pray today for a real sense of your presence. And you will speak to us and you will help us, God, as we worship together and as we hear your word. Thank you. We give you our love and our praise Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So uh, we're going to start by singing together uh, some worship songs. And the, the, uh, the worship team have been uh, here meeting and uh, we've got a couple of songs that kick us off, get us right into the heart of God's presence and his love for us today. So let's sing together. Um, beautiful song. Oh, praise the name. No, oh, oh, there it is. Here we go. It's coming. Jesus. 
of you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful and All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice For you have led me through the fire And in darkest nights You were close like no other I've known you as a father And I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God, Ooh, yeah. all my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good, every breath that I am able, oh I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness it's running after, it's running up for your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me, yes, Lord. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your it's running after, it's running after me. So my life you have been faithful, yes Lord. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh I sing of the goodness of God. Oh yes, I will sing of your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, it's chasing me down. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. Sing it again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me with my life, with my life laid down. I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. To outrun your goodness 
nowhere I can go to outrun your goodness. Nowhere I can go to outrun your goodness. Nowhere I can go to outrun your goodness. So good, isn't it? So good to know. No matter where you go, whatever you're going through, uh, the goodness of God can meet you and transform everything around us. Um, we, we're in a series at the moment uh, on prayer. And uh, last week we listened to Pete Gregg talking about unanswered prayer. And uh, you know one of the... Uh, one of the most challenging things in, in, in life and in the Christian faith is the, the issue of unanswered prayer. When we cry out to God and we're desperate for him to intervene, help us in some way, um, and, and the answer doesn't seem to come. And that's always been an, a challenge to us. Uh, and uh, we're going to break bread together today because even though many prayers that we've prayed maybe for a long time have been unanswered, and when sometimes we go through periods of life when heaven seems to be silent, when God seems to be absent, uh, then we know, we believe, we stand today on the, the truth that God is for us and he's with us and he loves us today. And his goodness is flowing towards us. Uh, so as we prepare for uh, bread and wine today, just to share communion together, I thought we'd just do a little reflection. Uh, on a famous story, maybe one that we don't often think about, but it's the story of Easter, and in particular, the story of a man called Joseph. Mm. And this is the scripture, it's taken from John chapter 19, and it says this, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the day uh, in between, the day of silence, the day when it seemed like for those followers of Jesus, their world had come crashing down. Joseph voluntarily asked Jesus, asked for Jesus' body. It wasn't forced upon him. He didn't draw the short straw. He experienced this burden due to his own volition and choice. Was it that he wanted to honour Jesus even in his death, to follow him even to the point of his finality? I believe that this is such an important and profound point to dwell on. When we sign up to a life of following Jesus, we have to accept that we will experience the glory of the resurrection as well as the burden of the crucifixion. But for all of us, there are Saturdays when we all have, all we have is the weight and the burden of taking the body of Christ onto our own frames. Like Joseph of Arimathea, we carry the dead weight of Christ. In his case, it was literal, but in our case, we carry the weight within our very beings, we perhaps bear the silence of God at times of stress in our lives and relationships. We long to hear God's voice and see his light, but his absence feels like a lifeless weight bearing down on our souls in the shadows. Joseph of Arimathea carried the corpse of Christ and bore the, the accompanying silence, even though he did not know that Resurrection Sunday was around the corner. We carry Christ in our hearts, and sometimes the weight of this burden is so substantial that we are left forlorn, downcast, even hopeless. This is the in-between 
Saturday heart of our faith. We acknowledge that faith isn't just Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Uh, it's the silence of Saturday too. So much is sitting in that tomb with the soon to be resurrected Lord. It's so dark, so cold, so scary. The silence is deafening. But there is hope in there. Emmanuel, God with us, in, is as much true in the darkness of the tomb as it is when the sun rises and the stone is rolled away. Jesus entered the, his tomb alone and forlorn, but he didn't stay there. Jesus welcomes us into the hope that Sunday is coming, that he is coming, and that changes everything. Can I encourage you today? Perhaps life feels messy. Uh, there are many unanswered questions, unanswered prayers. I encourage you to join Joseph of Arimathea as he enters a messy bit of Jesus' story. Perhaps nothing has turned out as you hoped. It was the same for Joseph. Perhaps you can't see how it all ends. It was the same for Joseph. As you sit with him, forlorn by the tomb, ask God for patience and peace in the waiting and the fearing and the not knowing. Let's pray together. Lord, on my silent Saturdays, today or whenever they come, I choose not to waver or move. I choose to stay with Joseph and Nicodemus, that you are still my Lord. And I trust that after every Saturday comes Sunday, after the crucifixion is resurrection, and after death is life. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to celebrate together and break bread because um, that's what we do. And uh, we've got here with us today, obviously, a little simple loaf and, uh, and some, some juice, maybe some wine. You've got some at home. And uh, we thought today, Joy, we'd break bread together. And uh, we're going to do that uh, with you today. Uh, so this is a wonderful, simple act that uh, as Christ followers, we've been doing for so many centuries and Jesus invited us to do this and remember him. We have a simple loaf, uh, an everyday loaf used around the world to remind us that Jesus came in a body into our world and his body was broken and uh, it was battered and bruised and he was tortured and he gave his life. For us. We give thanks, Joy, for, mm. for this bread. Yes, Jesus, you called yourself the bread of life. And it is your body and blood, your salvation that sustains us. You gave your life for us in place of us. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your love that didn't let go and never lets go now. We trust you, Lord Jesus. We feel like we're in the Saturday, but we're not giving up hope. We thank you that your love is steadfast, unchanging, unmovable. And we celebrate your death and your resurrection as we take this bread and wine. We give you our heartfelt, grateful thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So wherever you are at home, maybe or on your own or with family or friends, uh, let's uh, take this bread and this wine today in simple remembrance of our Saviour, who entered a dark cave, having been brutally killed. And uh, it seemed forlorn and, and lost, but actually, as we know, the story changes dramatically. And he is with us today. The risen Lord Jesus is present. And we are so thankful, aren't we, as we 
remember him and as we take bread together today uh, we do so in remembrance of thankfulness thank you lord Thank you, Lord. Let's uh, let's sing together and just enjoy the words of an old hymn that expresses so much of what we are, what we feel today, in response to the sacrifice and the everlasting love of our Lord Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross, that our sins could be forgiven, and we could have peace with God. And if you're listening on this call today and you don't know your sins are forgiven, you don't have peace, Jesus is just a call away. Yeah. And uh, we pray that even in this moment, uh, you will open up your heart and you will confess your sins and you will say, Jesus, save me, forgive me. Let's sing this song together. When I survey, the wondrous cross. Yeah. 
So thank you, worship team. That was wonderful. So I'm, it's my job this morning to talk about our next subject in the prayer series, and that's contemplation. And I thought when Gordon asked me, oh my goodness, I haven't done contemplation for quite some time. I used to do it many years ago, meditation and some contemplation. But when I became ill in 2014, I gave it up and I haven't really done it since. So when he asked me, I thought, oh, I better start doing it again. But I can't be talking about something I'm not doing. So I've started doing contemplation again, and I'll tell you a little bit about that during my talk this morning. So I want to base my talk um, st by starting with two passages from scripture, uh, just to root what we're saying in scripture, because there is um, evidence that people waited patiently for God and sat in his presence. So two Psalms this morning I'm going to read. The first one is Psalm 62, and we'll read the first two verses, if you want to look it up. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. It says, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. I think the fact that he learns those things about God, about his being my rock, my salvation, and my fortress, and my victory, is because he spent time waiting quietly before God. And then the next psalm, Psalm 63, it says this, O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. I think those are such beautiful words. And they come out of someone who sat in the sanctuary and gazed on the power and glory of God. So what is contemplative prayer and how do we do it? I've got three points about this prayer. Its definition, its goal, and its results. I've got three results. And then we'll talk about how do we do it. So definition of contemplative prayer. To contemplate is to look thoughtfully for a long time at, or to think deeply and at length. I understand it to mean to focus on some aspect of the story or nature of God or Jesus and stay with that focus to gain insight and experience of what we are contemplating. The goal, why do we contemplate? It is to intentionally put myself in the presence of God. To get to know another person, I need to spend time in their presence. I watch them, listen to them. My spirit perceives the sort of person they are, and I respond according to what I pick up. I can grow to like them. The same is with God, because he is a person. But there is a dimension to spending time with God that you don't get with anyone else. This is because God is beyond our powers of reason and understanding. He has powers that we don't. He thinks and acts differently to us. It is the mystery of his character. It is his presence that uniquely connects with our spirit and influences us. I like this quote. It says, in understanding and articulating the Christian faith, we must make room for the concept of mystery. 
not as an irrational complement to the rational, but as a reminder that the fundamental reality of God transcends human rationality. And my third point, the results. There are three. The first one is that we experience connection. This is because we use our imagination and our brains cannot tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. Imagine going to the cinema. You know that what's on the screen isn't real, but think about how it affects you. You might become angry or sad or upset or happy. That's because even though you're watching something that doesn't, isn't real, it's pretend, made up, your brain doesn't know that, and you react as if it was real. So imagination makes you feel as if it's real. So based on what you're reading or seeing, you imagine things about God. Your brain thinks it's really happening, and you feel connected. Good, isn't it? I don't know about you, but last week I found myself being really feeling really upset about not being able to come to church, really fed up. I miss being connected. I miss the joy of being with people. Every week during the service, I cry. It lets the pain out. But I want to ask, does being with each other normally, when we're normally together, actually mask the fact that we're not connected to God in the vital way that contemplation gives us? My recent engagement with contemplation in the morning has already given me rich rewards. Most mornings I had a song come to mind, ones that I hadn't sung for years. I used these to praise as I thanked God for reminding me of him. Then I had the experience of the intense presence of God like a cloud just below the ceiling. It gave me such a sense of shame and of feeling unworthy. I didn't know I had this shame, but I wept. And since then, my love for Gordon has been revitalized. The rewards for pursuing God in contemplation are rich indeed. And then there's God's side of the connection. Richard, Richard Foster writes, Today the heart of God is an open wound of love. He aches over our distance and preoccupation. He mourns that we do not draw near to him. He grieves that we have forgotten him. He weeps over our, our obsession with muchness and manyness. He longs for our presence. My second point of the result is that it gives us joy and satisfaction. This connection fulfills us at our deepest need, our deepest desire. Remember in Psalm 63, verse 5, it says, You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Jesus wants us to have joy. It was one of the things he promised us just before his death. He died so that we can be filled with joy. My third point is that we get an, an, an awareness of the risen Christ. I'd like to recommend this book. Abba's Child by Brennan Manning. I read it 15 years ago and I just reread it and it's still as brilliant. But this time I understood it more. I'd like to read just a couple of passages from it. I'd like to read this whole chapter called Present Risenness. It's brilliant. But I'll read you two excerpts. Standing on a London street corner, G.K. Chesterton was approached by a newspaper reporter. Sir, I understand that you recently became a Christian. May I ask you one question? Certainly, replied Chester, Chesterton. If the risen Christ suddenly appeared at this very moment and stood behind you, what would you do? Chesterton looked at the reporter squarely in the eye and said, he is. And then a little bit further on in the chapter, a short story. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's famous short story, The Great Stone Face, a young boy stares at the face carved in granite and regularly asks tourists in town 
if they know the identity of the face on the mountain? No one does. Into manhood, midlife and old age, he continues to gaze on the face at every opportunity. Until one day, a tourist passing through exclaims to the once young boy who is now a weather-beaten old man, you are the face of the mountain. Contemplative awareness of the risen Jesus shapes our resemblance to him and turns us into the persons God intended us to be. So where do we start with contemplation? Well, if you listen to Pete Gred's talk on this subject, and I really encourage you to do so, he talks about three stages of contemplation, beginning with meditation, moving to contemplation, and then to communion. So what is meditation? Meditation calms your mind. Contemplation renews it. The Bible tells us that we are one with God. He is in us and we in him. It couldn't be a closer union. I heard someone say that we should take our connection with God for granted, in a good way. It's always there, his presence. The only way we get out of, uh, get out of feeling it is by disobedience. So meditation is also called centering, and we concentrate on the Christ within us, his spirit, the one that lives in our belly. And we begin to focus our man, mind by breathing a breath prayer. The words match our breath. So you could say, Abba Father, as you inhale, and I belong to you as you exhale. You repeat, repeat this phrase as you breathe. You are trying to center down and concentrate only on your phrase. I have found and still find this incredibly hard to do, though practice has made it easier, and God is very kind and present. I find my mind starts going off in one direction or another. The trick is to keep bringing back it back to your breathing and your repeating. It teaches you patience and perseverance. Both of those are good virtues. When you have brought some calm and stillness to your mind, you can leave it there, or you can choose to contemplate. Traditionally, there is examine. These are traditional ways of contemplating. Examine, a way of reflecting to see God's presence in past moments. Lecto divinia, which is a fourfold pattern of sitting with the passage of scripture. Or Ignatian prayer, a way to meet Christ by entering into the biblical story. Or soaking. And we're going over to Lynn Horobin, who is going to tell us about soaking and her experience that she's done over the years. So over to you, Lynn. Hopefully we'll be going over to see Lynn hear what she has to say. Hello, there she everybody. is. Hello. Um, first, let me say that I'm not an expert, but I can tell you about my experience and how I came to be doing soaking and finding it really helpful. Um, soaking is also called resting in God's presence which kind of explains it all, doesn't it? It sounds really good and highly desirable. It's about being quiet and setting your mind and your heart on God, our loving Father and Jesus, our Saviour and very best friend. It's knowing that our Father and Jesus are completely focused on us and delighted to spend this dedicated time with us. It reminds me of that lovely verse in Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That's Zephaniah 3, verse 17. How good is that? 
It's about receiving his goodness from the Holy Spirit, peace, love, kindness and joy. And that's a bit of a familiar list, isn't it, from Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. The fruits of the Spirit, which make us more like Jesus. It's listening to anything God wants to say to you, and you will want to make a note to help you not to forget when he does. It's good for all aspects of health and the effects of stress. It's healing and it helps sleep. It increases the ability to be aware of God's presence at all other times. I heard about soaking when a friend invited me to a Sunday service at Christ Church Swanley about eight or so years ago. I was there invited to their new soaking sessions, which were running on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 9 p.m. It was come and go as you like um, during that time, but very quietly, so as not to disturb others. They're, they're not operating that anymore. Everybody is practicing it in their homes. People would lie or sit comfortably on the chairs or lie on the floor anywhere in the church, but at a distance from others and a lot more than six feet. I went in expectation, complete with exercise mat, cushion and blanket, and a list of guidelines on how to was given on the way in, and also a slip um, of paper with a few Bible verses on if you want it. Um, and it, one like that. I came across that recently, but that's another story. Um, gentle, relaxing worship music was played continuously. And the first time I went, I was surprised to hear a song by Grace Williams, who I'd seen on Christian TV. I'd bought her CDs and I'd rested while listening to her CDs at home for a few years and found her music very beneficial at times of great sadness and stress due to family illness and bereavement. They were not called soaking music anywhere on the disc, um, but she was described as a musician, uh, a songwriter and a psalmist. Then I realised at Swanley that I'd been resting in God's presence to her music and without knowing it, I'd been soaking. During the Christchurch sessions, I heard many different singers and composers. Some songs had words and others were just instrumental. My new favourite became Julie True, that's T-R-U-E, um, who does both. I also have other soaking CDs, including a Russian pianist called Alyosha Ryabinov, that I love too. I must say that soaking is not just for the hard times. It's a way of coming closer to God, getting to know him better and practice hearing from him. And it's a very good preventative health strategy. I would feel impoverished without it now. Mm. And I put my CDs on every day. I find that they help when I sit down to rest, uh, pray, read my Bible, daily readings, or I'm reading a book the book that we're doing at the moment as well. Um, I play songs with words or instrumental songs, um, depending on what I'm doing. Um, I always put one on very quietly at bedtime and fall asleep to it. And if I wake in the night, I put it on again. Nobody else can hear it. I have a CD player next to my bed, one in my sitting room and one in the kitchen. Uh, I call that low-tech multi-room. It's also good for background music in the house. It's peaceful, gentle and calm. I was reminded of King David's words in Psalm 27, verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. David also speaks of delighting himself in the Lord. We can do that too. It's impossible for me to overstate how good it is to rest in his presence. Julie True has her own website where you can listen to her music um, streamed and buy CDs or MP3 versions. There's also a link to her on her YouTube channel where you can listen to more songs and albums. And if you enter soaking music on YouTube, you will find many other musicians and some providing um, hour long music uh, free and Wilmington if any of you need help to get any CDs don't hesitate to contact me and back to Joy now please 
Thanks, Lynn. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. So I have written an example of Ignatian prayer. It's um, a meditation on um, the feeding of the 5,000. And I, I feel the Lord has given it to me. I asked him, what shall I talk about? And this is what came to mind. So you might find it helpful to actually close your eyes while I read this imaginative story to you. Uh, so the idea is to concentrate and use your imagination. Here we go. So Bartholomew, Bartholomew and I had had the most amazing two weeks. Talk about power, man. Two men with leprosy, several who had epileptic fits, a child with a cleft palate, don't know how many blind people, several cri cripples. Honestly, we lost count. And then there were the demons. We shut them up, we did. We did it, Jesus. Wait till we tell him. Can't wait, in fact. It'll be so good to get back. And the trip was fantastic, but it's worn us out, to be honest. We finally caught up with Jesus and the others in the middle of town. But it was obvious that he wasn't himself and he wanted to get away somewhere quiet. He was also aware that we needed a break too, even though we were bursting to tell him the awesome stuff we'd been doing. On our journey to somewhere quiet over the lake, Jesus informed us that he had a visit from some of, some of John's disciples who brought terrible news. John had died in prison. In fact, he'd been beheaded by How could this have happened to such a man as John? Jesus was visibly upset, and we realised he needed time to get away and process this awful tragedy. The wind was with us, and it took us a couple of hours to get across the lake. It was good to be away from the crowds, and we were anticipating a day of relaxation with lots of banter as we recounted our stories of the last two weeks. As we approached the shore near Bethsaida, to our horror, we saw that crowds of people had already got there before us. In fact, many were still running to be there when we arrived. Groan, oh no, just when we thought we were gonna get some peace and quiet. We suggested that it might be a good idea to go somewhere else, but Jesus, getting out of the boat, saw this huge crowd and couldn't help himself. He was always so full of compassion that he couldn't leave the situation like this. So we all piled out and Jesus spent the rest of the day teaching this crowd many things about the kingdom of God. He even healed all those who were sick. It felt like a long day. So late in the afternoon, we disciples started exchanging glances and motioning to each other that we were more than a bit peckish. We got together for a conflag and decided that we really had enough of all this and we were going to ask Jesus to send everyone away. After all, we were in the middle of nowhere, we were hungry and these people had to go away and find dinner themselves and maybe somewhere to stay the night as well. So the 12 of us mooted our idea to Jesus. Well, it did feel like we ganged up on him a bit, but we were desperate to bring this whole shebang to an end. Don't you think it's time to stop, Lord? I'm really, I mean, really, it's getting late. And that is when the tables were turned. Jesus never did what was expected and simply said, will you feed them then? What? At first, we thought he was joking. What, us? Feed all these people? Then we realised that he wasn't actually joking and we hastily began to calculate how much money we'd need to feed these hordes. It was hard to work out, but it would be at least 200 days wages. How were we going to find that? This was ridiculous and Jesus was being completely unreasonable. He even led us along by putting Pete Philip on the spot. Philip, he said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? What were we to do? The crowds were getting restless and we were getting increasingly stressed. We felt under pressure. Then, an idea. Maybe people have actually brought food with them. Ah, oh, yes, good thought. So we dispersed in every direction in the vague hope of finding food among the crowds. It was a bit of a long shot, but at least it would be something. After a good while of searching, 
None of us came back with anything, except that is for Andrew. He had found a small packed lunch, enough for one boy. That was it. But that wasn't gonna go very far. Honestly, we felt bewildered, totally out of our depth. That was when Jesus finally gave us something to do. Get everyone to sit down, he said. Well, there were 12 of us and roughly 20,000 people. So this was no mean task. At least control had gone back to, to our leader, Jesus. And we now just had to do what he said. We were tired, hungry, and definitely out of sorts. But the area was sloping and grassy and word soon got round. Sit in groups of 50 until every, eventually everyone was settled. Now what? And this is something I shall never forget till the day I die. We were the only ones left standing, Jesus and us, 13 of us. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, said a prayer of thanks and blessing over them, and began to break them up and give them to us. It was startling, jaw-dropping. I kept trying to see what was actually happening. He just kept breaking and breaking and breaking, dividing and dividing. Pass it round, he said. Give it out. Come on, there's more here. James, take this lot over there. Peter, you serve the groups up at the top. Look, here it is. There's plenty here. Some more for you, Judas. And so it went on. Backwards and forwards we went. We were the A-team, giving out free dinner to 20,000 people. This was the stuff of dreams. This rabbi of ours was totally, absolutely awesome. I had no idea it was going to be as good as this. This was wonderful, and we were in on it. People kept sticking up their hands for more. Over here, over there. There was no shortage at this fe feast. Everyone was stuffed. And us? Well, we'd done the running around, but you know, the weariness had gone. We were really pumped by this, all of us. Jesus showed us that day that though he looked just like one of the rest of us, and the hands that he used to break the bread were just like ours, he was actually the provider. He has set us up, put us in an impossible situation where we couldn't see beyond our own thinking. He revealed himself to us, making something astounding out of what we'd found and given to him. I think he actually loves this, these situations that are beyond us. You see, he is the provider. That is what he does. You know, doing this has renewed my mind. I've thought of things I've never thought of before. And my heart is full of joy. And I've only just begun. I bet that you will remember this story far more than anything else I've said. That's because imagination equals connection. I hope you felt connected to Jesus because that is what he wants. Can I encourage you to try it? You'll be richly rewarded. That I can promise you. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Lynn. Wow, that's, uh, that's given us something to think about and maybe try. That, um, that would be good, wouldn't it? That's uh, contemplative prayer. And it's one of those tools. You remember at the start of the, uh, of the journey into prayer, we got the toolbox out and we talked about how there are different kinds of prayer, like tools that we need for a, a particular job. And uh, this is one of those forms of prayer that I think is probably for many of us neglected. And maybe today you've had a bit of a prod. Uh, someone like me, I'm a bit of an activist. And I think, you know, uh, sitting and being still and contemplating, allowing my imagination to kick in is definitely something I, I need to do more of. So maybe like me, uh, you'll give it a go this week and spend time soaking, thinking, imagining in the presence of Jesus. Let's just pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, thank you that when you walk this world, and you gathered those friends around you. You imparted so much of the peace and joy and power of heaven. 
And we want to pray that our journey with you, our connection with you will be enhanced, will be deepened as we en yes. engage ourselves in the practice of this mm. kind of prayer, mm. where we sit without agenda and just be in your presence and allow our imagination to go into your word, into your story, so that we engage with who you are. Bless us, Lord, we pray. We thank you for your goodness and grace to us. And we ask your blessing on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's so good to be in this journey and, uh, and thinking about all these aspects of prayer. And uh, we're going to wrap up uh, right now. And uh, we're just going to sing one more song to go out today. Uh, if you're joining us and you're on Zoom, uh, we'd love to see you after the service. Do connect in again on our normal Zoom uh, meeting place, 974-1201444. And uh, after about 10 minutes, about 10 past, we'll, we'll clock in again and hopefully meet other people on there or in the room so that we can see each other and chat and share our news. So uh, let's do that. Let's just sing this song together and spend a little moment in the presence of Jesus. I love you, Lord. And uh, we're just going to respond to him as we sing together.
Have your ways, Jesus. Have your ways. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, to be in your presence is our joy and our privilege. And uh, we pray that this week we will be able to enter into that place where we love you and adore you and uh, spend time with you and hear your whisper mm. and uh, just feel connected with you even mm. though we're struggling lord not being able to meet and be in the same room uh, uh, without massive restrictions we pray lord jesus that we will enter into your presence and mm. find our deep delight with you mm. so help us god in jesus name amen Thank you for joining us today. If you joined us on Facebook, on YouTube, thank you so much for being with us. We pray God's blessing on you. We're here again next Sunday morning, 9.45, uh, regular clockwork, and hopefully you can join in again. Thank you so much, but bye for now. And uh, for those of us who are uh, joining us on Zoom today, uh, do come back in... I don't know, five or six minutes time, get the kettle on. Uh, we'll come back for coffee and a chat uh, at around 11.10 and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us then. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. Uh, God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye.